and welcome everyone. We are thrilled to see so many of you here on this rather cool Tuesday evening. First, I'd like to acknowledge the Kamaraigal land on which we are fortunate to live. My name is Kristen Locke and I'm the spokesperson for North Sydney's Independent. North Sydney's Independent is a growing community group which is working to find and elect an independent candidate for the federal seat of North Sydney at the next federal election. For those not familiar with the boundaries, our seat runs from Gladesville in the west to Cremorne in the east and from Kirribilli in the south right up to Chatswood in the north. A little about me, I'm not the candidate, I'm just a Hunters Hill woman who grew up in Lang Cove in the 70s and 80s. I'm a mother and a wife with two teenage daughters and I'm doing this for them. I would like to see them living in a thriving Australia and on a healthy planet Earth. I joined North Sydney's Independent to find someone to represent my voice and our voices in federal politics rather than those of the political parties, their machines and their lobbyists. You can find out more about us via our website or follow us on Twitter, Instagram or Facebook. And please, if you don't already, subscribe to our weekly newsletter. This evening, we're pleased to be joined by our neighbour to the east, the Independent member for Moringa, Zali Stegel. Zali was elected into Parliament in the last election after a career as a barrister and Olympic skier. Zali, of course, was elected against ex-Prime Minister Tony Abbott in what was once a safe Liberal seat using the community up process, the sort of process we are using to find an independent representative in the North Sydney electorate. Tonight, Zali is going to answer your questions about her climate change bill, where the findings from a parliamentary inquiry were released last week. Our own member for North Sydney sat on that committee. She'll also, also answer some of your other questions about her time as a member for Warringah, including ICAC and the Canberra gender issue. Welcome to you, Zali. Some Thank you, Kristen. It's good to see you. So Thank you very much. Before we begin, though, I'll, we'll be speaking for the full hour. So please keep your sound on mute and feel free to use the chat anytime and of course, keep it respectful. We are recording the session again. So sorry, Zal. Uh, if you don't want to be seen, please turn that camera off. Again, you can do this by clicking the stop video tab on the bottom left of your Zoom screen. We asked for questions prior to this evening. And if you have any more, please add them to the chat where if we have time, which I doubt, we will aim to get to those. Uh, first, quickly, let's introduce tonight's audience to Zali. On the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a reactions tab. And if you click on that, you'll see options to give a thumbs up or down to this question. Are you from the North Sydney electorate? And a warm welcome to anyone from outside our electorate. Hands, thumbs, they're all good. Thank you, heaps. Thank you, well done. Now let's get straight into the questions. First from me, Zali. The findings of the Parliamentary Committee inquiry into your climate change bill were released late last week. Can you tell us about your bill? What is it and why did you take this step? Well, thank you so much and welcome everyone. It's great to see such a big turnout. Um, we know that from small things, big things grow. Uh, and that's what we need to do when it comes to climate action. Um, if I could say, first of all, I came to politics, I, you know, left my career as a barrister because I felt that I simply couldn't um, sit on the sidelines any longer, uh, feeling unrepresented by my current, my member at the time, um, and feeling really dissatisfied with what he was doing to our environmental policies and our climate change policies. So when I... Uh, uh, ran in the 2019 election, it was very much on a platform of sensible politics around climate change uh, policies, our transition to new technologies, and obviously the opportunities that come with that, because that's the part that is considerable is the economic opportunities of getting this right and taking the opportunity. Whoops. Don't know what happened there. Um, still here. Um, so obviously i my, my pledge was to be a climate leader in Canberra. And so I uh, very quickly uh, put together legislation, the climate change bills, uh, modelled on the legislation from the UK that was passed with bipartisan support back in 2008. So they are some way in front of us. Um, it's legislation to uh, lock into law a commitment to net zero 
no later than 2050 with mechanisms to bring it forward uh, in accordance with the science and expert advice. The key aspect is that we have five year emission reduction budgets to achieve that. Uh, obviously establish a climate change commission that is expert independent and expert based which is important um, but it, is, it doesn't assert the role of government it is an expert based commission to advise on the status of technology of emissions of risk and adaptation and planning um, and it is then up to the government of the day to implement policies that respond to that advice um, and, and obviously we need risk assessment and adaptation. So that's what the bills do uh, in a nutshell. Now the inquiry was very important because the inquiry allowed um, the private sector, the business, business industry, investment, health, uh, unions, to have a say, uh, environmental groups and individuals within communities around Australia, to have a say on what they would like to see uh, our climate policy, how, what would good policy look like? How will it impact them, their lives, their industry or their sector? Because we only ever talk climate really at election time and then it's wrapped up into so many other policies and so much fear mongering that we really never get to the bottom of the, you know, what's important about the policy and what um, opportunity and what difference it will make. Um, and it becomes a polarising choice, uh, which makes it very difficult at election time. So the inquiry was incredibly important to put on the record why we needed this legislation, this framework legislation. Now, we had over 6,500 submissions. If some of you made submissions, thank you very much. They were all amazing. Um, we had three days of public hearings uh, with incredible testimonies from a very diverse group. Um, and we had... 99.9% .9 support of submissions, ranging from a lot of individuals all around the country to the Business Council of Australia, the Australian Industry Group, uh, the Electrical Trade Union, Union um, ACOS, uh, the Australian Medical Association, so uh, Planning Institute, Architects, Green Building Council, so really broad, broad section of Australia, uh, civic society, environmental groups and business all wanting this framework, wanting us to lock in a very clear policy so that they can plan for their next 10 to 20 years with clarity. So the inquiry was uh, interesting. It, obviously, parliamentary committee, it is a coalition majority committee. Uh, so they obviously dominate the vote. Um, but it was, you know, the intent of this kind of committee is to put partisan politics aside and approach an issue with an open mind to make recommendations back to parliament. Um, unfortunately, uh, I think the, the partisan politics ultimately was at the fore. Uh, the majority uh, coalition committee uh, recommended and passed the recommendation to, re to recommend to reject the bills um, and really stuck to the uh, line, um, there was very little evidence provided in the inquiry to say that we were doing okay now, that what we have in place policy-wise was sufficient. Essentially, the only evidence before the committee was from the Department of Energy, um, you know, from the government itself, or the Department of uh, Environment around our risk assessment. They were the two basically official bodies coming to the inquiry saying, look, don't you worry, we've got this, we're doing well enough already. And so the committee has uh, basically uh, hooked on to that um, and said, look, we are meeting and exceeding our ambitions and our emissions reductions. There is no need for us to do anything more. Um, and so recommended to reject. What was interesting though, was during the course of the inquiry, uh, the Department of Energy was specifically asked have they been briefed by the Prime Minister or the government or the Minister, Minister Taylor, to model our plan of net zero by 2050? Um, because at the moment, all government modelling stops at 2030. There is literally nothing publicly available that goes beyond 2030. And so while we have the Prime Minister announcing that he would preferably like to reach net zero as soon as possible, preferably by 2050, I think it's legitimate to ask the department have they genuinely been asked to model such a preference 
you know, if and if it's not by 2050, when is it by? Mm. Now, they really were unable to answer those questions and really skirted around it. And it, well, there was an inference that it was a no. They have not been asked to model that plan. Um, and similarly, the Department of Environment, who is responsible, which is under Minister Lee, who is responsible for the risk assessment around Australia of how exposed we are to climate impacts, was asked whether they have modelled the cost of global warming and risks of climate impacts and conceded that no, they have not modelled the overall cost of climate risk. And lastly, the Climate Change Authority, which essentially I'm proposing to replace with a truly independent climate change commission, the Climate Change Authority, which was has been very much underfunded and uh, really uh, pushed aside by Minister Taylor and the government, also conceded in oral evidence that they have not updated any the, the government with an advice since 2015 on what our emissions wow. reduction ambitions should be. And they have not been asked by the government or the Prime Minister to model net zero by 2050 and the pathway, pathway there and what our pathway our emissions reduction pathway should be to stay consistent with the Paris Agreement goal of staying as close to 1.5 degrees of warming as possible. So all in all, um, entirely unsatisfactory response by the majority of the committee to what was, I would say, unequivocal evidence before them um, of the need to improve our policy and framework around climate change in Australia. Yeah, it's astounding. It's like a teenager saying, I don't have to submit that till for a month, so I'll do that in 29 days and I only need to get 51%. Like, aren't we aiming for influence <laughs> in this country to lead and to bring an economy to our next generation? Ah, yeah, that's astounding. So what were the findings of the inquiry in the end, Zaya? Well, the official findings from the, the, so the way the report works is you have a majority report by the majority of the committee and uh, that was only coalition majority that voted for not to debate the bills uh, with some notations that some aspects of uh, transparency or accountability or uh, the five-year budgeting would be, had benefits that the business community recognised. So there's some acknowledgement that there were benefits, but very little. Uh, then uh, the members for North Sydney and Bass, so Bridget Archer and Trent Zimmerman, who are coalition members on the committee, put in a statement, which is a, a, another sort of an additional view to the main report, which interestingly enough, they reaffirmed their commitment to net zero by 2050 and call on the government to confirm that, but were not willing to support recommendations that I put forward um, to ensure that we actually plan that net zero. So I, I would say very hypocritical um, and really um, an empty kind of statement. It's really a positioning yourself to publicly say, look, I'm saying all the right things of supporting net zero by 2050, mm -hmm. but when it comes down to it, I'm not really willing to do anything to support that. Mm -hmm. um, Labor put on their own dissenting report. So the Labor members were Josh Wilson and Josh Burns, um, but also supported the recommendations that I put forward. So I then tabled a very lengthy dissenting report really rebutting a lot of the arguments that had been put forward in the main report um, as to why the climate change bills shouldn't be accepted. The main arguments put forward were, and I would say they're really uh, grasping at straws for reasons to ignore all the advice and all the submissions that were, and all the evidence we heard. Uh, but the main uh, excuse given for not supporting the bills was the formation of the Climate Change Commission that that would be a duplication, but in essence, it's really implementing a proper, a good independent expert-based commission. Uh, it's a suggestion that it's usurping the role of elected government, uh, that the Climate Change Commission would essentially, and passing these bills would replace the need for government to put in place policy. Now that is entirely incorrect. The bills in no way uh, uh, override the government of the day and the minister of the day's ability to form policy and set emission reduction budgets and, and support what technology it wishes to do it. 
all the commission does is it implements a cop on the beat, essentially. Think of the Reserve Bank. It essentially implements an independent commission that will publicly report for the benefit of the Australian public, assess our progress, make recommendations as how we can best get there, and then hold, I guess, a, you know, keep a, a, a watching brief on developments around emissions reduction. And I think that's really important. And if I could make the parallel to our response to COVID, which has been 100% based on following the advice of unelected health experts. Our chief medical ex officers around the country are not elected. And yet our entire national policy and response has been on the basis of their advice. So it's an entirely hypocritical argument to say it's acceptable in terms of COVID but not acceptable in terms of climate change. Um, the other aspect that they that has been brought as a reason not to support the bills um, is uh, that the locking it into law uh, takes away from the basically the partisan policy wrangling that you get at every election, which is the very thing so many across the Australian sector are asking to get rid of. Yeah. Uh, the UK have managed to progressive emissions reduction to vastly superior ambition to us uh, through Brexit, through disruptive politics, and it has stood the test of time with bipartisan support. So it really is a model that is seen as a gold standard model. Uh, one of the evidence at the inquiry was actually that the bills would be a North Star for Australia for our climate policy and emissions reduction. So it is telling. Um, but look, the, the dissenting report went into a lot of detail around all these objections, and I certainly won't have time to cover it all tonight. Um, but really looking at the evidence we received and, all, and rebutting the arguments put forward and why it was so important. I was trying to be very constructive, so I put forward a number of recommendations, really kind of cascading down to the ultimate one, which is that the climate change bills should be debated and passed in Parliament. First recommendations were, in fact, that we should ensure the Department of Energy is, in fact, tasked with calculating and modelling our pathway to net zero because it was so ambiguous from their evidence that they're even doing that work. We, as a committee, should, at the very least, ensure that they are requested to do that work. And so it was quite telling that Trent Zimmerman, despite saying he's committed to net zero by 2050, was not willing to vote in favour of that recommendation to instruct the department to do the work. Same, we are. the next recommendation was asking the Climate Change Authority to model a pathway to net zero and advise on the level of ambition Australia should have by 2030 and 2050 to ensure we stay as close to 1.5 degrees as possible. Again, despite all their protestations of support for climate action, Trent Zimmerman and uh, the, all coalition members did not support that recommendation. Now, this, these are not, um, these don't have to be seen as political um, recommendations. These are basic climate policy recommendations to ensure we have the appropriate level of planning going ahead from all these departments that are said to be the ones that are sufficiently capable of taking care of this policy area that we don't need to institute a climate change commission. And finally, one of the last recommendations that I thought was vitally important was that we instruct the Department of uh, Environment to conduct a risk assessment of our exposure across Australia, because we have a huge amount of communities of public assets that are exposed and there is no coordination of the risk that we are at. And we can't forget the 2019-2020 bushfire season, Australians being evacuated from our beaches, people homeless, our cities blanketed in smoke. Um, we need a proper risk assessment to occur. So that was the basis of the bulk of the recommendations, and yet even they could not find support by coalition. So I am a little bit um, frustrated and wish to call out that there is a level of hypocrisy to have a stated support for net zero by 2050 and climate action, but not really be willing to actually vote for 
constructive steps that would make a difference for that. Yep. It's hard to be a member of North Sydney and not feel, listen to Trent on one hand, see how he votes and not feel fraud. There's some kind of fraudulent position going on. It, it's really it's really disheartening in the whole political system. And we've got a question uh, from Louise in Crow's Nest going to Trent uh, regarding our local MP's reaction to the bill, that's what we've been talking about. Um, now, Trent Zimmerman, as you were just saying, was on that committee and blocked the bill. So Louise asked, why do you think, goes to what you were just saying, Mr Zimmerman says in the report that climate change is unquestionably one of the greatest threats facing the world in the 21st century, but then blocked the climate change bill. Does he have to vote with the Liberal Party every time? Well, look, at parliamentary, at committee level, no. Um, the point of parliamentary committees is that they should be able to be bipartisan, that it should, it is the opportunity to put aside the partisan politics of the chamber and the, the whole public scene of it, um, and actually get to grasp with the issues and try and work together for solutions. That is the point of parliamentary committees. Um, sadly, we know, uh, despite, look, the, the Liberals and the Coalition are supposed to be the party of the free vote, but they never exercise that free vote, mm -hmm. are actually... Uh, one of the most free, recent one, well, obviously the most recent one was the same-sex marriage vote, but prior to that, it was, uh, I believe, in uh, 2011 on the um, uh, morning after pill. I, I was watching Misrepresented on the ABC and they were reminding me about that vote where mm -hmm. we had a bipartisan vote around that. So it's not impossible. Um, it can be done. And it is time for that to happen when it comes to climate policy. Um, and where is our overall commitment? Um, so why does he do it? Well, look, um, I guess I'm a little cynical about uh, people within parties, which is why I am an independent. Um, I do believe at the end of the day, there is um, so a personal ambition of wanting to be promoted within uh, the party and get to a ministerial position. Um, and I believe that there is a strong belief that you don't get there by um, rocking the boat uh, mm -hmm. or challenging the, the public line. And so whilst they may argue for things internally in the party room, they are not prepared to vote in accordance with the rhetoric and what they say publicly. Um, but that is part of the call in relation to the climate change bill is actually like same sex marriage, like many other issues, uh, this should be a conscience vote, we need to open this up. The difficulty we have in Parliament is we have the coalition held to ransom by the Nationals, essentially, there is a minority of members of Parliament who simply don't accept the science. Um, and they uh, will block and threaten the stability of government if there is any attempt to put in place better climate policy. Uh, we've seen the re-election of Barnaby Joyce um, at the Nationals. Now, ironically, he is a member of the coalition who has crossed the floor numerous times. So when it serves his political um, ambition, he is quite happy to exercise that free vote. Unfortunately, we don't see that done by any of the so-called moderates of the coalition. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, in, in many ways, I see them as the most dangerous members of parliament because they lure their electorates into believing they are genuinely committed to climate change action, but their vote never reflects that. I mean, if you vote for you know, Matt Canavan in the Senate, you know what you get. Uh, you know he's not going to vote for climate. But um, for many others, the, the talk is cheap now. You really, It really now is time to see policy uh, and we need to see action. We are in a decade where it is going to be vital that we, along with all of our international trading partners, um, increase our emission reduction ambition. We need to more than double our ambition to reduce emissions by 2030. And at the moment, there is no political will by the coalition to do that. No. So what's next for the bill then, Zali, after this? Oh, I'm a big believer in you have to hold people accountable. So the bill um, will be uh, reintroduced, slightly amended, because there were some very constructive amendments put forward during the inquiry, and I want to reflect that. Um, so I will be reintroducing the bill with those amendments and I will push it to a vote because I think it's important for 
electorates to actually have a record of seeing how their members did vote. Um, it, even if it is just in a suspension of, I will need to suspend standing orders to uh, bring on a vote. And so members will be on the record for their vote in that respect. Um, and I think that's important because we know within the next 12 months, we will have another election and people need to start looking at their members for their record. Yeah. Just out of interest, did Trent Zimmerman even, did he approach you? Did he try to be constructive with this bill to try and support it, to, to say, this is how you could obtain my support? Is there any effort? Oh, look, I had numerous discussions with many people um, on all sides of politics. I, uh, and I haven't finished. I will be out there discussing some more with many. Uh, I met with Barnaby Joyce. Uh, I will try and meet with him again. I met with Pauline Hanson. Uh, I met with the Crossbench, the Greens, Labor, and many backbenchers. I uh, met with the Prime Minister and the Treasurer. And I will raise this again. Uh, uh, no, um, there, there was a stated reservation by, by Trent in relation to what he was concerned about. And I would draw everyone's attention probably to the transcript, which I believe I've identified in the dissenting report, where, in fact, he put to Dr Penny Sackett, who is um, the previous uh, or two ago uh, chief um, scientist, Australian chief scientist, um, that really an expert commission should only investigate models or technology as instructed by government because if there wasn't political will what was the point of advising on possible options that weren't politically palatable and to me that is incredibly back to front the yeah. point of the expert and, and Dr Sackett's evidence was very firm in that the experts are there to provide all evidence of all levers that can be pulled. It is then up to government and the political will to determine which, which levers they choose to pull, how efficient they will be, and the public can judge on the outcome. Yeah, yeah. Um, next, we have a bit of a surprise question up. Nikki Hutley. Uh, Nikki is an independent economist and she is on the Climate Council and she lives in our North Sydney seat. Um, hi, Nikki. It's lovely to have you here tonight. What's your question for Zali? Thanks, Kristen, and thanks, Zali, for giving up your time and congratulations on all the work you're doing. Um, as a counsellor, it's so frustrating to... There's so much information that people at like the Climate Council put out there that's just being ignored. Anyway, my question to you is, is around um, what's going on in the international environment and what that might mean for us. We're seeing lots of change happen. The G7's been talking about climate. We've now got the EU's fit for 55. What's your sense of the international mood and how that might influence what ha what's happening here? And especially, you know, what our economic outlook is on, on climate issues if we if we fail to, to follow the, the crowd, as it were? Yeah, thank you. Look, there's no doubt it's been well reported in the media um, how much the international community has moved. If there's been any silver lining out of this horrible COVID pandemic, it has been that it has actually um, really accelerated countries' response and transition in technologies. Um, a, 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 you know, a reasonable proportion of recovery packages across the EU and the UK and, and other countries have been dedicated towards uh, accelerating transition to low emission technologies. And so that is an incredibly beneficial thing. And we've seen as we lead into COP26, which is coming up in October this year, um, there's a, a vast increase in ambition. Uh, obviously, the election of uh, President Biden was very helpful in driving that international change, um, and they have set a very ambitious um, commitment to uh, reducing their emissions by 2030, but also committed to that net zero by 2050. Uh, the UK have been leading the way in that, and now we're seeing uh, the carbon border tariff adjustment announcements. You know, the EU has now uh, voted in favour. It is a strong discussion out of the UK and the US are looking at it as well. It won't take long for other trading partners to follow suit with, for example, Japan, who has also committed to net zero by 2050. Uh, we've got China has committed to net zero by 2060, but working on progressing that. Now, what that means is that is good news from a climate point of view globally. It means we now are seeing a, a movement. 
But we need to make sure that accelerates. What we're also seeing is an acceleration of impacts. Um, we can't ignore uh, the heat, horrendous heat waves we're seeing in North America occurring um, at record melting of polar ice caps, just, you know, fires, temperatures, the floods recently in Germany and, uh, and Belgium. The, clearly the impacts are accelerating and so ambition needs to accelerate as well. The good news with that is there is a real international consensus now around needing to act and really Australia is quite isolated. Um, the Prime Minister's spin around what Australian's ambition is, um, is not really uh, going to be sufficient for the international community. And it will start to cost Australia in terms of our relations and our trade and export opportunities. I've met with a number of the diplomatic community in Canberra, and they are all quite bemused. They simply don't understand why in Australia we can have every state and territory government committed to net zero, announcing ambitious plans. You know, New South Wales is committing to renewable energy zones and really progressing. And we have abundant opportunity. We have space. We, have, we are the most, uh, the continent in the world with the most sunshine. We have wind. We have opportunity. We have rare earth mineral. We have the minerals even for battery manufacturing. And yet we have a federal government so unwilling to grasp the opportunity. And it is a huge economic opportunity. So the international community is quite bewildered by Australia's reluctance to transition and take um, advantage of the position it, it could have. Um, and we are really at risk of being left behind. This is the decade of transition. Um, huge amounts of money are being invested internationally in those transitions. And Australia is simply not seen as a favourable uh, market to invest in. And we're already seeing a real decline in international investment in large projects. Of course, the renewable energy target expired some time ago, and there simply are no drivers anymore for really driving large scale investment. And what we're seeing is actually the quite the opposite, which is the government intervening in the market. So uh, the proposed curry curry gas plant, for example, is a really concerning and negative impact. Uh, the energy market operators, all the experts are saying it is not needed, it is going to be a disruption, and it actually discourages private investment. Um, so that's really concerning that the government is taking such a, um, uh, just a, a very negative um, uh, outlook. Um, and this whole idea of, um, you know, gas recovery, uh, I call it the gas folly, because really it's, um, it is not needed. Our, all our integrated system plans indicate we don't need it from an energy security or safety, uh, you know, stability point of view. We have sufficient gas in the uh, in the system, and what we need to do is actually focus on grid transmission and facilitating the the rapid integration into the market of um, rooftop solar and large scale renewable. Yeah, it's strange the government isn't just neutral. And they're certainly not promoting the renewables economy here. They seem to be promoting the sort of video chain blockbuster, old fashioned stuff. It's, it, I just, I don't get it. Um, Nikki, could I sneak you a quick question um, as our in house North Sydney climate economist expert? In the PM's words, if you had to look Australians in the eye and tell them what net zero means for our electricity prices and for our jobs, what would you say to them? Well, they're, they're two quite separate issues. On electricity prices, um, you know, all the, all the hysteria that we had around the impact of the carbon price, we actually saw uh, electricity prices once that was introduced fall. And electricity prices are made up of a whole load of different things. The element that comes from investing in renewable energy that's the component that's falling. And if you have a look what's happened in South Australia, the more they have invested in renewables, and they actually had one day late last year where they had a whole hour that ran 100% on renewables, so it's you know, technically feasible, they are having the biggest falls in electric electricity prices rather than rising. So the idea that you can't do any of these actions without having massive price increases is just, is just incorrect. It's around, we know that the marginal cost of putting 
um, solar power or wind power is so much lower than um, gas, which is ridiculously expensive, uh, the most expensive just about, um, or coal, which to build a new coal-fired power station, and by the way, there is no such thing as clean coal, and if I hear one more politician say that, I'll punch their lights out. Um, you know, I just, it, it, the, the lies get me really frustrated. There's so much economic evidence. I'm watching the chat with people saying, can we have a report on this and can we have a report on that? There is already lots of evidence around this. And, you know, an example is my former colleagues at Deloitte Access Economics last year, we, we actually put out a report on the cost of climate change. And it, it come, turns out that it's around about having a COVID size shock to the economy every single year within, within a few decades. And this is not that far. This is within our kids' and grandkids' lifetime. Yeah. Conversely, if you invest a small amount around $67 um, billion, it sounds like a loss, but it's a lot less than we've just invested to get through the COVID mess last year. You can generate 10 times that amount in economic activity. And that's from all sorts of sectors across the economy. It's not just about renewables in the energy sector. It's about retrofitting buildings. It's about the ag sector. It's about um, transport sector. And if you just want to look to what's going on in the ACT at the moment, where they're promoting um, zero emissions vehicles, mainly electric, they're putting a bit of money up front, but they're already attracting as a leader and showing leadership in that sector, they're attracting new players into the market. They're having all sorts of conversations. They've got you know, new research happening and grant funding happening at the universities. It's not just about producing cars, which we might not necessarily do efficiently, but they're all these downstream activities. So the opportunities are enormous. And if we just sit here and do nothing, you know, I'm sure Zali, I mean, I don't know how you do it, and keep your cool and don't get frustrated <laughs> at what you see going on around you. I think the key is I, never, you never accept defeat and you keep pushing. You keep, just have to keep finding an argument. At the end of the day, with every conversation, with every Zoom call, you have more and more people aware, focus, focusing on the facts. There's been a lot of misinformation over the last decade and we need to counter that. I think there's a lot of people in the media also to bear a huge responsibility for the misinformation that we've had around this issue. Um, and we will all pay a price um, in terms of our safety and our health um, that I, I think is uh, unacceptable. We don't have a partisan debate over whether we should have a defence force or a national security. Um, and so this is something that should be bipartisan. Uh, and most countries in the world look at us with bewilderment that this is not bipartisan. Mm. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, straight on to the next question. Uh, Pat from Kirribilli, Zali. Do you think we'll ever see meaningful action on climate change from the Morrison-Joyce government? <laughs> Look, I don't have a crystal ball, but I, my, my reading of the Prime Minister is he... Um, he, he will move if he feels that his votes are impacted. So that's why it's so important that people really um, put the pressure on their local MPs because no one should be safe uh, and should be able to hide from this issue. Uh, look, uh, obviously he has a dilemma in now having to deal with the nationals with Barnaby Joyce. Um, but look, at the end of the day, this is uh, a problem of his own making. Uh, and he, ha he bears responsibility for the delay, for the procrastination. Uh, and look, you know, delay is the new denial around climate change action. And so for many years, we had people de denying the science, you know, questioning the facts. Now we have people uh, putting the handbrake, uh, really denying that there is a need to act with urgency uh, when really we are in a very crucial decade. And we're seeing that from an environmental point of view in terms of acceleration of, acceleration of changes and warming occurring at a greater rate. But we're also seeing it in terms of the pace of investment um, and changes and focus on technologies. What we've seen in the last 12, 12 months around announcements from car manufacturers talking about uh, when they will phase out their manufacturing um, uh, of ICE vehicles and go towards only EVs. I mean, Australia does not have a, a car manufacturing industry. Uh, and so we are entirely reliant on what can be imported. And we simply will not have the infrastructure at this rate 
to, to really be able to bring in and take advantage of the best models. We still have an incredibly low uh, take-up rate of electric vehicles. We have no federal pol national policy. Uh, we're seeing states announce their own policy and we're ending up with this hodgepodge mess of very different and contradicting approaches from state governments. What we really need is a coordinated national approach, um, but the federal government has no EV policy. Their future fuel strategy paper has been widely ridiculed um, and it is it, it's a gaping hole transmit transport is 20 percent of our emissions this is an important sector that we really uh, and it's a low-hanging fruit this is not a hard one this should not be hard to uh, get behind and there are very simple levers we could be looking at whether it's things like uh getting rid of uh, the luxury car tax for electric vehicles, creating incentives, uh, incentives when it comes to um, capital gains and fleet for, from a corporate point of view. Uh, look, I put to the minister that we should at the very least have the federal fleet of cars um, ele uh, electric, um, and he felt that it was more a question that the private sector should do it. So. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I see a lot of nodding heads. <laughs> Look, there are a lot of frustrating conversations yes. in Parliament. Um, but the key is just, you know, look, I, I'm not someone who's ever quit uh, and I don't let up lightly. And so for me, there are so many sensible arguments for this um, and so many opportunities that this, this will happen at the end of the day. It is inevitable. Uh, the question will be what price will Australia pay for having delayed our transition. Yeah. Slightly different topic, federal ICAC, really. Trish from the FDA, <laughs> yes, straight on to the next one. Is behind the scenes wheeling and dealing in Canberra, is it worse than you thought it would be? And if so, what can we do about it? Oh, look, I'm, I have to say I had low expectations in my experience <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, they were sadly not right. You know, sadly, I was not mistaken. Um, I've been quite shocked, I have to say, at the poor standards of accountability. Um, report after report comes out from the Auditor General about the misspending of public funds. And this is at a time where we have record level of debt. We have so many people in the Australian population under significant financial stress from COVID, from uh, where things are at, and yet we have a complete largesse and, uh, and, and complete, I would say, mismanagement of public funds where these programs get rolled out with, um, I mean, I think pork barrelling has been taken to a whole new level uh, in the last three years under Prime Minister Morrison that is unacceptable. And you have to look to the top. Um, this ultimately will reflect on his leadership um, and he needs to take responsibility. And unfortunately, we haven't seen any uh, Westminster, you know, there's been no, the, the ministerial standard has really not been applied. There's been no accountability. Uh, we've had numerous scandals and very little uh, responsibility or uh, consequences. Yeah. Um, and I find that really concerning because it is just huge amounts of public money that are not being spent uh, on merit. And the irony that there is always so much talk about the need for things to be done on merit uh, in a place like Canberra. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yet, when it comes to public spending, uh, it is just done completely differently. I mean, we have the news in New South Wales of the ICAC having really been beneficial and having brought down corrupt politicians who have now been found guilty uh, by, in the court proceedings uh, when you look at um, Eddie Obeid and Ian McDonald and co. So that is the benefit of a strong ICAC. Uh, there is a very strong model for a Federal Integrity Commission that's been put forward uh, by Helen Hayne my fellow independent from INDA, I seconded the bill with her and also pushing for a code of conduct for parliamentarians. Now, as a barrister, we are bound by rules of conduct in court. I was shocked to find out that parliamentarians do not have a code of conduct. We have no professional standards. There is no accountability. Uh, I appreciate the argument is we are accountable to our electorate every three years. Um, but that is only so far as the media and people are able to know what really goes on. Uh, and so it's important to pull back the curtain on Canberra a little bit um, and have people more aware of what's going on. So I desperately need a Federal Integrity Commission. I strongly support that. 
But we also need an overhaul of the workplace. We've had so many scandals this year with Brittany Higgins and the allegations. Uh, Kate Jenkins is now undertaking her inquiry. She's just released an interim report. Um, I welcome that, but we still have not seen any drastic, um, you know, bring, bringing of accountability for some of uh, some very poor behaviour, I think, that, that it, there is still very much a toxic culture, I believe, in Canberra. So uh, um, the next question goes straight to this. Richard Nataman says, this year we've seen too many issues to name. I mean, they just kept rolling, didn't they? Every week, it was like, what's going to go wrong now? To name regarding misbehaviour in our parliament, particularly towards women. As someone who's recently entered politics as an independent, what's your experience with these issues and what will it take for things to change? Have other parliamentarians come to you, women parliamentarians? Uh, look, I guess my experience as an independent is very different, I believe, to someone in a party. So I think a lot of the misbehaving occurs in the party room uh, because that is where there is that real rivalry for promotion, for numbers, for how do you win influence. So I think that is where the, there is a level of toxic, you know, of, of toxic culture that is there. Uh, and I'm actually concerned that that's a real um, conflict of interest compared to a member of parliament's duty to their electorate and duty to the parliament. I believe we should have an overriding duty to the Australian constitution and to the parliament to uphold the integrity of parliament the way, uh, the same way as a barrister as an officer of court upholds the integrity of the court and the judicial system. Um, so I'm concerned that there's a real gap there in our system when it comes to our representative democracy. Um, what I've observed is, yes, there's plenty, there is plenty of toxic masculinity. There is plenty of bullying that goes on. Um, there is too much drinking, I believe. Uh, I believe there's a number of people on both sides of politics, backbenchers, who um, have too much time on their hands that are not busy enough with the business of parliament. Um, and, and so, yes, I have observed misbehaviour. Um, people have come to me in light and ex-staff have come to me around uh, concerns and engaging with the Jenkins review. Um, so I think we need to call that out. But look, it's really difficult because there are, I, I guess I have, a, I probably don't believe that the best representation in politics comes from people that are career politicians, mm -hmm. career politicians that have started as policy advisors in the parties that are working their way up, but then, you know, their loyalty is rewarded by being put up as pre-selected to then become a member uh, of a seat. To me, that feeds a level of loyalty to what I call the firm, which is, you know, you're within and you simply don't call anything out. Um, I think the members of parliament that have come from uh, more external with other career experience, I think bring a lot more depth to the parliament. And look, it's really hard. There are people in parliament, you know, some of the members of parliament are genuinely there to serve their communities and do their best. I have no doubt about that. But I think that gets quite corrupted by the party machine and those influences. Um, and I find that quite concerning. So I think, um, I do hope we can grow, uh, you know, I think more independents that don't have that conflict of interest. Uh, we don't have a conflict in that sense. We work in a very collaborative way amongst ourselves, um, but we ultimately review a position on legislation, on merit, on feedback from our electorates, and on um, and I've, and I think we are quite united around questions of principle of how you approach um, each piece of legislation, and I think that's really important. Yeah. Ken from Wollstonecraft asks: Being an independent, what difference would getting more independence on the crossbench make? And can you and other independents actually get anything done? Oh, absolutely. And we get a lot more done than backbenchers, can I say. <laughs> um, uh, the, the reality is I can move amendments. I can, I, I get, I will, I will receive briefings from departments when it comes to legislation. I can, I would, uh, you know, request meetings and get many times meetings with the ministers to raise issues. I raise a lot of the issues constituents bring to me. Um, 
and I also obviously liaise a lot with groups like, um, you know, uh, the Law Council, uh, Institutes and Universities, Business Council of Australia, industry groups, um, ACOS. I liaise with them to hear their concerns about legislation and then address that with the departments, with the ministers around legislation. Um, and now that is something that I don't believe many uh, <laughs> Members of Parliament other than independents do to the same extent. So, yes, um, members, as an independent, I can do a lot more. Um, and the reality is we also ask our own questions. No one hands us our written out, you know. We at least have the freedom to ask our own questions. Um, the other aspect that, look, at, you know, I was successful in passing amendment to legislation and really di directing the conversation and focus on certain issues. So independents are incredibly uh, powerful. And I think it's really important that we be in an era of sensible independence where this is not about personality politics but it's about good governance and I think uh, I very much enjoy my, my, my colleagues on the crossbench like Helen Haynes and Rebecca Sharkey um, and uh, uh, Andrew Wilkie around that approach of good governance. We don't agree on everything. We don't vote similarly on everything, but we have uh, common principles uh, around how we do it. So what more independence will do uh, is you'll, it will ensure much greater scrutiny around legislation. I believe the best thing that could happen for Australia would be a minority government because that ensures uh, policies and legislations that are stress tested that have to be uh, uh, they, they require a collaboration currently the way legislation is passed is by a secret deal between the liberals and the nationals uh, we don't have access to the coalition agreement between the liberals and the nationals you don't know what the what the what the deal is um, and yet that is the negotiation that occurs for every piece of legislation so what an what a minority government and more independence on the crossbench will do is it will bring out those negotiations into the public because they will happen with people outside the coalition. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, I can't believe, but I think we are nearly out of time. Um, the chat room, I'm wondering what's going in on in there. Do you have any big questions or a little report from the chat room? Um, Denise, could you... Let us know. Hi, everyone. Such an interesting conversation. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. The chat has been running quick and fast, to say the least. A level of frustration, of course, with what's going on in climate change. And Zali, thanks so much for your wonderful comments. Um, yeah, a few questions. Sadly, we won't have too much time to get to them because we're nearly on time. Um, I just want to repeat perhaps Robin's comment saying where is north sydney zali we know you're out there so yes please yes um, where are you, are you yeah, may, and maybe i could touch on that a lot of people uh view politics as um nasty and negative and i think um well look you know obviously with some of the shows and some of the incidents you would you could be forgiven for believing that um but it's actually incredibly rewarding and incredibly positive. Um, I have a really, really good relationship with many members of parliament, uh, with, in particular with Helen and Rebecca on the crossbench. Um, it is an incredible privilege to be in parliament with an opportunity to debate these issues, hear and listen to everyone um, and make a difference in that sense. Now, um, there is a side of politics, you know, it's an inv there, there's a side where your life is then in the public sphere. But in this day and age when we have so many important issues to deal with, I would encourage anyone who is thinking about it to get involved with groups, with local government, state government, federal government, be an advisor, join a group, be part of it. At the end of the day, we will never achieve anything by being bystanders. Yeah, that's it. The worst enemy are the people who stay on the couch. Um, we need to lean in. So when we leave here tonight, just as a final question, Zali, what can each of us do to get more involved, to really lean in and help North Sydney, right next to you, become independent again, like it used to be with Ted Mack? 
Well, yeah, in North Sydney set an incredible precedent with Ted Matt. So um, I think, if, look, you are doing it in terms of reaching out. I think if every person reaches out to their network, one person reaches 10 people, 10 people reaches their 10, and this spreads very quickly. We saw that in Warringah. Uh, the sense of pride um, of, and of ownership of the outcome. I was only, you know, I was sort of, I, I, I was the name in front of the movement, but there was a huge groundswell of people, local people who wanted uh, wanted to turn Moringa turquoise. And that's what was so, uh, that, that was, that pumps up my tyres because it, I know that I'm not in it alone. I'm in it with so many people in the community. So, um, I think you're all doing the right things. Write to your local MP, demand meetings, write to the Prime Minister, write to your local media. You know, we need to change the media conversation, uh, support the causes, join the groups, keep talking to everybody. Uh, look at some of the um, voting kind of websites and mechanisms to keep accountability around how people vote, have the conversations, sign up to be a volunteer and help the cause. Yep. Um, and I do believe Climate for Change, a climate group in North Sydney is having a letter writing day next Wednesday. Um, in terms of what we can do, if you don't already, please subscribe to North Sydney's independent Friday weekly newsletter. That's the key place where we where you can keep track of our news, our progress and the candidate search. Uh, we plan to host these Zooms with special guests more often. So keep an eye out for that in the newsletter as well. Uh, we also hope to start our democracy walks and our Sunday socials again as soon as the lockdowns are lifted. So we'll have caps and we'll have T-shirts and we'll be walking and drinking and talking together. And um, that's it. So thanks again to Zali Stegel, the independent MP for Warringah, for joining us tonight and to each of you for getting involved. Oh, perfect. Yeah, that's good See you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you, everybody.